Okay, uh, good evening. Um, can I get a thumbs up that you can hear me first? Is that possible? Okay, great, thank you. Um, hi, um, my name's Russ Hyde. I'm a data scientist at Jumping Rivers. My, my colleague, Keith Newman, should be answering questions in the online chat. Um, and uh, yes, the, the, the topic of the talk today, um, it, it relates to shiny applications and um, how you make them more efficient, how you make them more enjoyable to work with as a developer and how you can make them, um, you know, a little bit nicer for your users to work with. Um, so we're going to talk about streamlining, which is sort of making your app more efficient. And we're going to talk about automation, which is about um, kind of removing those um, tasks that are a bit boring or a bit repetitive or whatever that, that, that you need to do on a, uh, as, as a, a developer. Um, Jumping Rivers that, that we work for is a, a data science consultancy in the UK. We work on the, the, the whole kind of uh, stack of, of data science projects, machine learning, um, shiny applications and things, and, and also the kind of data engineering and infrastructure side as well. Um, the, if there's a phrase that encapsulates the, the, the ideas behind this um, talk, it's that data doesn't stand still uh, or even sit still. Um, now, over the past two years, we've been working on a working with an application um, that was originally developed by Dean Atali, and we've been working on this with uh, Roberta Pastore's group at the World Health Organization. Um, this is a shiny dashboard for presenting COVID-19 vaccination counts. Um, so within the application, you can see things like, um, you know, the uh, vaccine uptake in specific countries or in specific age groups or even in like subpopulations like the um, health worker subpopulation of, of, of a given country. Um, as you can probably imagine, the data upon which this app is based is, is a moving target. So from week to week, there's new um, vaccines being uh, administered across the world. And that data is... Um, gradually feeding into the app as, as, as time goes on. So um, the data in this uh, particular application, so the, the counts of, um, uh, of, of vaccine doses and stuff came originally came from three main databases, uh, one of which uh, Tessie was kind of the main of the, of the bunch that the, the, the WHO were involved. We're going to sort of illustrate how a data um, source might evolve over time in, in this image here. Um, so the first thing, the, the, the simplest change is that on a, you know, maybe on a week by week or day by day basis, you might get new releases of data. And if you're developing an application that's aiming to present that data, it wants to be in sync with the most recent version of, of the data. If you're integrating multiple data sets together, you may have a kind of mismatch between when one data set gets updated and, and when another does, and, and your app has to be able to account for that. Uh, similarly, you can get changes in the actual structure of the data. There may be new columns added as, as time goes on. There may be um, a, a change in the encoding of um, specific columns or something in, in, in your data set as, as time goes on. And then finally, something we're dealing with at the moment is that um, as time goes on, you might find that um, uh, you may prefer to spend, uh, to, to work with one data set over another. So we're changing preferences as, as time goes on. We'll move on. Um, this is a typical Shiny app, and this is the kind of structure of a Shiny app that would always be in sync with that data. You have some raw data for, for a project like this. That would be raw data that's stored online somewhere that you would 
import into the the R process where your application is running and do a bit of processing on um, to generate some process data and then present that within your dashboard. That would always be in sync because whatever the raw data is at, at, at the, the period of time when a user started their session, um, that would be the data that gets processed and, and presented to the world. The only problem here is that transferring data is 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 quite um, expensive. Well, not expensive. It, it it can take a long time, and processing data can certainly take a long time, de depending on the the source and depending on what you need to do with it. Um, so if you start ending up with multiple users all working with the app all at the same time, you end up with multiple sessions uh, processing and downloading the same data um, and doing kind of, you know, doing the same tasks uh, in a way that's kind of quite inefficient. And, um, and so... Um, that there are ways to solve that problem. Um, now, data is slow in a lot of different ways. The, the transfer of data from one place to another can be quite slow. The processing of data can be quite slow. And the transfer in, you know, uh, so anyway. So there are uh, lots of places in your source code that you can improve the efficiency of your um, your your application by you know rewriting a function here or there, but sometimes it's better to do a little bit of measurement, a bit of profiling of, of your your code to work out uh, you know if you need to speed up an application, um, spend some time getting um, information about you know how fast it, it starts up. Um, so this is um, a tool called Google Lighthouse, which will give you a report on how fast your application starts, how quickly the images uh, um, it, it arise on the screen and things. Um, and you can run that within your browser. Uh, there's a tool in R called ProfViz, which will do a kind of visual profiling of your source code. So while you're running a Shiny app, if you if you run a shiny app inside this a call to this profvis function when you then close that shiny app you'll get a graph that looks like this which kind of in a way illustrates how much time the app spent running a particular function and you can get a further detail of like how long a given function ran for and how much memory it used um so the it's important to measure because there's no point optimizing code unless it's going to bring an appreciable uh, improvement to your actual project. That's changes you could make to the source code. There are changes you can make um, that, that don't necessarily involve, you know, getting right deep in the weeds of um, rewriting functions and things like that. An incremental improvement you can make over that initial app that I showed is to, um, so in that initial app, processing of the data was going on in every user's session. But you don't necessarily need to do that. You could actually do the processing in one user's session and store whatever the process data is. And then when any other users come in, they will their sessions will download the process data and you don't necessarily have to go through that process thing. You have to do some stuff to uh, ensure that the process data stays in sync with the raw data. You know, if the raw data becomes newer, um, then the processing pipeline might run again. So that's a slight improvement. But what that means is that for some users, your app might run really slowly, but for most users, it will run quite fast. Another issue with data is that the, the its transfer is quite slow. Um, and um, uh, it, it, this is just some illustrated data that I made for, for my own machine a couple of weeks ago. So the speed at which data can move from the hard drive to the processor is about th three gigabytes per second, whereas network data, you know, by a kind of internet speed test is about a thousand fold slower than that. So, <laughs> 
if you can minimize the amount, well, from the previous slide, if you can minimize the amount of processing that you do, um, if you can minimize the amount of data that you need to transfer across the wires, you will speed up your application. Um, so a, a, another incremental improvement that we can do is we can only transfer that data that the user actually needs. So in the, the previous um, figure I showed, um, for every user's session, the raw data is being downloaded in, in full here. And in some cases, it's getting processed, and in others, it's not. You don't necessarily need all that raw data if you are downloading processed data as well. So there may be a partition of the raw data that's only used to generate that processed data. And if you can identify that, then you don't necessarily need to download that every time a, a user connects to your app um, and they can use the processed data instead. Um, so that was a slight improvement that we gained. But still, it's not particularly brilliant because still some users will have a poor experience because it takes a long time to run the data processing pipeline, but most users won't. The final change that you can introduce is simply to take the processing outside of a Shiny app. So rather than downloading the data that you need, running your data processing inside the app, you can move it to like a scheduled task or something whereby on a daily basis you run your data processing against whatever the most recent version of the data is generate a, a processed data set that's then uploaded to a, a data source and then you can whenever a user interacts with your app that that data will get downloaded and, and and used and now there's no data processing going on whatsoever in the application but the problem with doing this kind of thing is that there's a, a kind of integration problem you you've now got data processing going on in uh, for, for us we were using um, something called github actions which i'll mention in a couple of slides time so these are running on running in a data center somewhere this process um, rather than in the running application. Um, so you have to be able to manage um, that additional complexity to the architecture of an app. Um, and the way that you can do that is by using kind of automation tools. Um, so um, automation, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, GitHub Actions. These are these are little scripts that run in your source code repository. So if you, they're, they're quite quite often used during uh, development cycles. So if you write a bit of new code and maybe make a pull request, if that's how you work, um, you can have a a little workflow that runs on GitHub to check that the style of your code's okay, to check that it runs any kind of automated tests and stuff. And even for a Shiny application, you can deploy automatically from GitHub. And I'll show you an example of that and a, and a, um, a workflow that can be used for that in a, in a minute. Um, and we used exactly the same process of like running, of kind of defining a, a workflow script that runs on a, um, on a specified kind of schedule. Um, which takes the data and does a bit of processing and then stores it such that the app can then um, uh, download it and, and run as efficiently as possible. Um, so yeah, the, there are other ways of, of running automated tasks. Um, we chose to use GitHub Actions simply because it was simpler because the, the actions run next to, you know, it, it looks like they run next to the code. Um, but these are these are things that you where you specify when should the workflow run? Should it run whenever you add new code? Should it run on a daily basis? Should it run? Should it be possible to to kind of manually set off a new workflow run? And and you can set other things as well, like the the type of tasks. Um, for deployment, so deployment's one of these tasks that like 
um, it it can be difficult if you don't have a kind of automated way of doing it. It can lead to some um, um, in, inconsistencies. If if I deployed from our studio on my own machine, I might get slightly different packages installed than you would if you deployed from your machine, even if we were doing it to the same account. And, and that can lead to inconsistencies in a, a deployment. So when you're deploying Shiny apps, there is actually a, a way to do that in an automated way um, from, from GitHub. You just need to get some account tokens. If you're, if you're working with shinyapps.io, like the, the app that we were working with here, you can get your username and um, some a, 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 a token for shiny apps and a, a secret value as well but these are secret values you don't want anyone to be able to see these in your source code you so you need to be able to store them in github in a secret manner and there are um a, there's a way of, of of storing secret values within github that are only used when these workflows run so for example we added a your username and a secret and a token to for, for, for this application um to actually deploy you 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 can sorry a, a typical workflow script looks like this um you define when the script should run so this just tells us that it's going to run whenever there's a whenever new code is added to the main branch of, of the repository. Um, and then we specify a few different steps that run. So these are actually, um, you might not, you don't really need to know the details of these, but basically it's like you're pulling in the source code, you're set, installing R, and then you're installing any packages that your app depends upon. Uh, and then in the second half of this, we actually do the deployment, which is just two function calls. So you write your code much like you'd write an R script. Um, so this is a function within the RS Connect package that sets your account info. And then a second function that deploys a, a given app name to, to the shinyapps.io server. Um, so these variables in here, secrets.shinyapps name, they can pull secrets that you've stored in GitHub. And that's a way of kind of automating the process of, of, of deploying um, uh, an application, which simplifies your life. So if you're making a lot of changes to a, 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 repo to a, a project, um, it can be easy to forget to do certain steps like, you know, making sure that tests run and, and deploy stuff unless you've got that stuff automated. Um, so in summary, um, yes, yeah, so we've been working with this COVID-19 app and it has um, gone through a series of evolutionary changes to kind of improve its um, user friendliness to improve the the speed that the data processing because people are making decisions based on this application so it has to be usable um, in summary to to it's it's best to try and simplify your app as much as possible to try as do if, if you're writing a data presentation app try to do as little processing as possible and to pull as little data as possible into that app because both of those tasks are really can can be really slow there are tools uh profviz for analyzing your r code and lighthouse can be used if you want to gauge over time whether there are improve whether the changes you're making are leading to improvements in the startup time of your application um, and then simplifying your life, you can automate the boring and repetitive stuff um, and uh, by, by using these GitHub actions. There is a repository uh, maintained by, I think it's by the RStudio team, um, that has multiple actions for things like linting and testing and stuff like that. Um, a, 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 a problem with this is that if you move processing and stuff out of your app, then the architecture of your whole project may become more complicated and it becomes a little bit more of, a, of an issue to, to keep it all in one, 
keep it all in your brain. And anyway, um, so that's my talk. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to thank the WHO and particularly Roberta Pastore for letting us work with this application over the past two years. Um, and oh yeah, if you want to know a little bit more about the topics we're talking about here, um, there are a couple of blog posts available on our website. Um, anyway, thank you for listening and um, I'll take any questions if there are any questions. Thanks a lot, Russ. That was a great talk. Um, there's one question in the chat from Eric. It's, uh, have you explored other alternatives to GitHub Actions for these workflows? He's seen that GitLab offers a similar service, but he's curious if there are any others that you've tried to use. Uh, yeah, I, I have used a lot of different services for um, for automation. We um, Our firm typically uses GitLab for, for almost all of our internal work. Um, and yeah, the, uh, the, 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 the tools that they provide, though slightly different to GitHub, they're, they're, they're perfectly usable. There, there are other alternatives, um, that, that, that are outside of GitHub, um, like, you know, um, circle CI and things. And also you can use things like deposit connect or, um, um you know uh, the 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 cloud uh you know as your type um services for 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 running processing on a schedule as well so there are loads of tools out there for doing this stuff um yeah awesome thanks um i don't see any more questions in the chat so we're still a little bit um, ahead of schedule, but thank you so much, Russ. That was an awesome No problem. It was my pleasure. It was my yeah. pleasure. I think that prof fizz was definitely a nugget. Um, make a lot of shiny apps, and I haven't done that yet, so might be scared to see what my code is actually doing, but I'll check that out. <laughs>